Okay, so this is me. Sorry, I do apologize, Shanti. <laughs> this is me again. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I know some people on the uh, webinar already, so thank you for coming on again as well. Um, I've been in property since 1986, so quite a long time now, um, 21 years of selling houses. And in the last 14, 15 years, I've been dealing with corporate relocation. So I'm one of many few agents that have done sales and lettings, uh, which is quite rare. Um, 22 years, I've been a landlord also. Uh, I've been a tenant for 10 years as well, 10, 12 years, I think now. Um, and I've also run a lettings and property management division of 250 properties. So from any angle you like, I can hopefully help because I've either been the estate agent, I'm now the other side of the fence, so to speak, looking after clients. Um, I know what to say to an estate agent. I know what not to say to an estate agent and when to say it purposely. Uh, I helped uh, Shanti move a couple of years ago into the UK, which is great, coming over from the States. Uh, she's a seasoned mover over the years. Um, she's very shy about that, but she's moved in, lived in many states and various countries all around. Um, so we provide a bespoke concierge service from property finding. Um, and people like to deal with Myself or Andrew, Andrew deals with the north of the country. I deal with the south of the country very generally, um, but effectively we do the same thing. We will find your properties. We'll get a property where you can't find yourself. We make sure we do our due diligence. We check the contracts, we do the checking, we do the inventory, schedule of condition, making sure that we're looking after you because we act for you. The agent acts for the landlord. It's been very, very tough the last couple of years specifically not just with COVID just viewing properties because there's such a shortage of houses around as everybody knows ask anybody in the chat groups in, in all the countries we're dealing with I think tonight we've got people from South Africa Canada States France Italy as well some in the UK already as well so that they're keen but we just so so um, pleased that we can help everybody and um, we've had a lot of we, a big improvement from figures from last year where people want our help because we just need to fight that much harder really for every single thing out there, every scrap, because there are so many tenants for so few properties. We just have to be there first. So it's not only um, looking at right move, um, Zoopla, et cetera, et cetera. It's trying to make sure we get into that agent first and be very assertive with them, not too pushy, but not too slow either. We've got to be just enough. We can ask them the right questions of what's coming on the market. What have you valued? What's coming on next week, next month, et cetera, et cetera. So really push the boundaries quite a lot, but not too much. So we push them out the way. Um, so that's enough about myself. Over to Andrew, who covers the north of the country. Evening everyone. Yeah, thank you for that, Mark. Um, Mark pretty much hit the nail on the head with kind of the band at the minute. Myself, um, Mark's got a, a few years on me. So I, I've been involved in, well, as a landlord since 2004 and have a small portfolio of properties and working in re relocation since 2008. So, so we've, yeah, 12 years yeah, now. And, and, um, and, 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 we've, we've covered people from all over the world, individuals through to families, moving with pets. So it's been a, yeah, interesting and good. And we've, we've, we've been very helpful. Um, like Mark said, we, we, we build the relationships and we're also local to the areas. So we kind of know the good and the bad areas to live within each city. And also that relationship with the agents to, to build the rapport, to get preferential not preferential treatments but we we know what to say to get the deal agreed in effect so um yeah that's that's everything about me and looking forward to to matt who'll be involved uh who helps all the household goods side of things thanks andrew Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry, Matt, I was going to give you a quick introduction, but it's fine. This is, this is our main guest speaker, uh, Matt, who, who can look after all of your household goods and removals. Over to you, Matt. Hi. Hi, everyone. I've had a uh, computer malfunction. Oh, brilliant. My slides have appeared. <laughs> <I'm happy. laughs> um, so um, we, we, we're a household removal company, so we, we ship household goods um, domestically within the UK but we do a, a significant amount of traffic so from international de destinations into the UK and also from the UK sort of to to international destinations around the world um, it, it's a fairly um, 
big subject that I'm, I'm aware that, especially in sort of South Africa where people are, are, view, are, are listening and viewing from, it's quite late. So I think it's important that we maybe just sort of hit some of the headlines um, and then I've got my contact details on there and if anyone else wants to sort of expand on any points, potentially if we have some time at the end, we can do that or we can pick, pick them up sort of away from this meeting. Um, when we're shipping goods um, around the world, sort of from country to country, there's two basic options, which are, which are very obvious. Air is an obvious option. Um, putting stuff on a plane is obviously very quick. Um, it's also very expensive. Um, so if you need essential items sort of in your new destination as you arrive, it's sometimes worth, it, it's, it's almost the equivalent of excess baggage, um, but we can, sh we can arrange to ship, but to, to fly stuff by air, but it's not really a, a, a hugely common occurrence, but just because it is, in, in my opinion, cost prohibitive. Sometimes it's cheaper to buy the stuff that you're going to fly over rather than fly it. Um, C is the most common way of transporting goods from country to country. Um, I think most people will be familiar with a container ship after seeing the evergreen ship stuck in the sewers last year. Um, the, 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 the boxes that you see stacked on the container ships are, are known as containers. Um, they're modular boxes. Um, they, they stack on top of each other. Um, they come in two basic sizes. So the larger ones are 40 foot, 40 feet, and the, and the sort of smaller ones that you see are 20 feet. Um, a, a, a mixture really of what we ship. You know, we don't just ship 20 foot, we don't just ship 40 foot. You know, a, a, lar a large family of four or five people would generally kind of fit what they need in a 40 foot. A smaller family of two or three people would generally fit what they want to ship and need to ship into a 20 foot, but it, it's not as crude as that. Um, there are ways that we measure and, and, and pre-survey your goods to be able to know what the volume that you're shipping and all of our costs and our planning and our pricing is generally based on volume rather than weight. You know, people people sometimes focus on weight when we're talking about shipping, um, but it isn't weight that we really focus on because furniture generally, furniture and household goods in general, generally have a lot of fresh air in them. So um, it, 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 we tend to fill the container, the space in the container before we um, exceed the weight limits of the container. Um, the basic kind of steps that we follow with every move we do um, we, we always do a survey. Um, obviously, in the last two years, the world's changed. Video technology, as we're sat here now, has, has become a mainstay. And, and video um, surveys are becoming the go-to way of us performing what we call a pre-move survey. So we, we have a look, be it in person, be it on video, of exactly what you're shipping, make a fairly detailed list, um, use our knowledge to create an estimate of how many boxes you need. Um, during that survey, we can talk about kind of specialist items, what um, kind of what you're sensitive about, what means a lot to you, what you think needs additional kind of care, packing and preparation, what we think needs some additional packing and preparation. From that point, we can then agree a, confirm a, a quotation. Um, we try and always quote what we call DTD which is door to door. So it's generally a, 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 as much as we can, an all inclusive price. There are sometimes unforeseen extras such as customs inspections um, on, and um, the kind of people shipping into New Zealand and Australia are sometimes subject to some cleaning charges that we don't include in our initial quotations because they are not always costs that are incurred, so they become extras that are charged sort of as the process develops. Um, once we know what we're doing, once we know what dates you're working for, um, we can then start to look to see what availability is on ships. Um, so th there, are, there are a lot of shipping lines that ship to England. There's a lot of shipping lines that ship from England. Um, it used to be you send an email, you get a container, and it goes on a boat whenever you want it to. Um, that's not quite how it is at the moment. Um, 
you know, there's there's squeezes on supply chains globally, and and we're feeling that squeeze and strain within our industry as much as everybody else. So it's becoming a little bit more of a challenge to get containers. We always get them, and we always get the space on the ship, but it can sometimes take a bit longer than historically we're used to it taking. But but we we kind of we've had some practice now. We kind of are, are adapting to this new way of working and thinking and. I think we're well placed that as and when you do need to ship your goods um, within an amount of tolerance, you know, we can't guarantee dates. We have to be a little bit flexible, but we, we can have an aim for a date and we can generally achieve it. Um, so once we've quoted, once you're happy with what we've quoted and the services that we've talked about, um, the kind of next bit that happens, there's some paperwork and stuff that happens kind of in the interim period. And then our packers will arrive. So if you're coming into the UK, um, we have agents in, in most countries around the world that over time we've built some relationships up with. So they may conduct your pre move survey and have the results to hand. We may have conducted your pre move survey by video, by, by video and relayed those results um, to the um, origin agents. Those guys will come, they'll know exactly what's expected. Everything that will fit in a box is wrapped um, in, in protective packaging. It's put in the box, it's sealed up. Um, everything that needs kind of a bit more special care is, is wrapped in, um, we call it export wrapping. And depending on where you are in the world, it's wrapped in really thick bubble wrap. It's wrapped in um, five ply paper, quite thick pliable paper. And very often then it's over carded as well. People are very often surprised with how much packing material is used during the packing process. Um, but that we've all seen those videos on YouTube with boats doing this and this and this, you know, and your worldly goods are in a container that are rocking side to side and backwards and forwards. So we need to make sure that they're, they're packed and protected really well. So every single piece is packed and wrapped and protected. So it's well looked after. Um, we make an inventory list as we're packing. So it's, it's an itemized numbered inventory. So every single piece that goes on the container has a number. Um, which is then checked on as we load it. Um, once that container is loaded, um, we then will generally close the doors on the container. Every container that you see on these boats is, is sealed, um, which is a, a, a bolt seal that once it's shut, you can't open it apart from with bolt croppers. Um, we close that seal that has a unique number on it that's unique to the shipping line that we're booked with. And that becomes, along with the container number, because every container number has a unique number, that becomes the sort of way we track your container around the world. Um, so once the container is loaded, the inventories are made, you've got your copies of the inventories, we've got our copies of the inventories. That's it. Your house is loaded on the container. You're kind of standing in, standing in the kind of front, front drive of your, of your old house. The truck drives away with all your goods on. And that's where the question marks kind of sometimes appear in people's minds people people kind of can picture it to this point but then there's often a lot of curiosity as to what then so um we'll just walk through that slowly um that container is pulled by a truck so the trucks that we all see whizzing up and down the motorway pulling these containers that that truck will drive to port um when it gets to port the container number the seal number gets checked in and then it, it arrives in the port, and I'm sure everyone's seen pictures of these ports on TV and news reports. Huge, great cranes lift the container from the truck into a system on the dock. So there's kind of a stacking system of containers. Um, if the ship or the boat that we're going to use is in port, it is then sort of goes from this holding area straight onto our ship. Um, generally speaking, there's a little bit of a wait and a delay um, at port whilst um, we, we want to make sure the container's there in time for the ship. We don't want to be kind of just in time. We want to be well in time. Um, so that sometimes the container will sit on, on the docks for a couple of days and then is lifted onto the ship. Um, the, the containers that we have are, are generally lighter weight um, as opposed to kind of general cargo. So if you do see a picture of a cargo boat, usually household goods are quite a long way towards the top. So if you see the top layer on a, on, a, on a container ship, probably there will be someone's worldly belongings within one of those containers. Um, the boat then 
sort of sets off fr from, from the origin port on its way to its destination port. Um, people say, how long does it take to sail from uh, Johannesburg, um, Cape Town um, to London? Um, and, and there is a stock answer to that, but the answer is it depends because it depends if that boat is going directly without stopping at any other ports, or is it stopping at every single kind of African and European port on the way to, to discharge cargo and reload with other cargo? And obviously each of those stops add time um, or not. Um, so it is there, there is a general rule of thumb and we know generally how long the voyages take, but they are subject to a little bit of variance depending on the shipping line. Um, so there's always a, got to be a little bit of tolerance for the timelines that we're we're dealing with. So your your, your containers on the boat, the boat is sailing. Um, we we can live track the ship, so we can give you a tracking link so you can see the progress the ship is making. Um, excuse me. And so then the ship arrives um, at the destination port. At the destination port, so let's say you're shipping into the UK, um, that boat will arrive and it's very much then that process in reverse. So the container is lifted off, it then sits in the dock. We then have to, we, we've already started the customs process, um, but we then have to kind of complete the customs process whilst the container is in the docks. The container won't be released until the customs process is complete. We then arrange haulage. For the container to be lifted onto the onto a truck, um, the truck then will um, haul the container either in an ideal world direct to your new residence um, or to our warehouse. At that point, whether it's offloaded into our warehouse or into your new place, we offload the container. Um, let's go with best case scenario um, for, for for this illustration that it's going direct to your residence. So you've managed to get your timing really well on you've got your property you've got your keys and you wait you're staying in the hotel nearby and you're waiting for the goods to arrive um goods arrive and then we open it so we double check the seal number we double check the container number we know that it's the right container in theory if there hasn't been any customs inspection that seal that you saw closed at, at your origin um point will still be intact and we break that seal as, as we open the container. So we have bolt croppers with us, we break the seal, we open the doors and then we offload the goods. The goods will be fairly well labelled, check the inventory off. We know that if, if it's sealed, everything that went on should have come off. Um, we place your goods in the room of choice, in the position of choice. Everything is unwrapped. So all the kind of um, packaging that I talk about um, earlier is unwrapped and taken away. Your furniture is then in the rooms, your furniture is in the right place. Um, and then very often we will then unpack your boxes for you. Um, and usually we would unpack onto a flat surface ready for you to then put your goods in the cupboards and in the drawers um, and around the house where you want them. And what this usually ends up with that we do a partial unpack of, of sensitive goods that are potentially fragile that we want to make sure of kind of made the journey intact. Um, so we unpack everything. You you kind of work with us putting it away. We remove the debris. And at the end of that process, and it might take a day, it might take two days, it might take three days, but at the end of the, that process, you you're then you you have your home then and your home is intact and ready to start living in and start using and it be, becomes kind of um your, your new home with with all of your existing um furniture and, and goods in there. Can you flick to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so points to, to touch on and to think about. Um, TOR, which is, um, is TOR is transfer of residence. Um, so we, the, the tax kind of office in the UK is called HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Um, most of uh, I can send all this information out about TOR, but so we'll just touch on it briefly. Um, so uh, most of the um, information that we need to do with HMRC is found on the gov.co.uk website. So the government website, gov.co.uk. Um, if you look on gov.co.uk, 
and search for apply for a TOR or how do I get a TOR? You'll be kind of led to the application point. Um, and what TOR, what the TOR system does is generate a TR, T, transfer of residence number, which in turn, once, once you've, we'll, I'll go back about what TOR actually is in a, minute, in a minute. Once you've got that TOR number, that then enables you to get a URN number, which is a unique reference number. And that's a tax code that enables you to import household goods tax and duty free into the UK. Um, so it's quite an important process. It's a really simple form to fill in. So what TOR is trying to establish, it, it, it clues in the name, trying to establish that you are transferring your residence, that it isn't becoming a second home or a third or a fourth home. You are becoming, uh, you are going from your primary residence in, in, the, in the origin country and, and you're, you're moving to a primary residence in the UK. Um, the form itself is, is quite simple. It's surprisingly simple um, and it's surprisingly easy. Um, and what the government are trying to do is they're trying to seek proof that you are a genuine person that should get tax relief. So they want proof of your existing address. Um, they want a bit of a description as, as to why you're leaving um, your existing address. They will then ask for proof of your new address if you've got it at this point. Um, if you haven't got it, you can kind of submit proof um, of an offer of a, of a rented place or if, if you're buying a place of an offer that, that you've got an offer in with an estate agent and it's going through. A human actually grants TOR, so it isn't a robotic or an automated system. So, so you can kind of tell your story and submit the relevant documents to that story and somebody will actually read them. Um, when you are doing it, it's best to do it on a phone or a tablet because you, you then have the opportunity to snap the photographs of your passport. Sometimes they want to see a, um, a photograph of your, your bank statement, um, proof of address. Um, but if you're doing it on your tablet as you go in, as you get to, to those points where you need it, you can just snap the photographs and just keep working through it. I've done it. Um, it's the same process when since Brexit. It's the same process when people are moving back to the UK from Europe. So I've done it for a couple um, of really elderly clients who weren't really able to use the technology. And I was really surprised how straightforward and easy it actually is to do. Um, but I'm, I'm ha again, at the, at the end of this, I'm happy to, to help anybody kind of go through that process because it is quite straightforward. But that's quite a key thing. And that TOR number is valid for 12 months. So you can start that process quite early. And if you don't get it the first time, you can ask for reasons why. Um, it's not a one strike and you're out. You can kind of work with the system a little bit and you will get a caseworker and they are quite good at helping you through it. Um, other things to think about, alcohol, unless you really need to ship it, it just causes issues. Um, if you've got an extensive wine collection, that, that is important to you, um, then yeah, ship it um, and we'll, we'll kind of declare it, but it's unlikely that you'll get that duty free. You'll end up paying duty on it. Um, and it, it just, it, it, it's possible, it's entirely possible. It just adds a little bit more to the process. Um, it's also worth considering any significant items of significant value um, because we generally, um, it will, will insure your goods whilst they're um, in transit, but insurance companies um, need to know if there's anything that uh, needs flagging to them really. And they may ask for more details and more descriptions just to make sure that the relevant covers are in place. Um, while we talk about values, um, we need to declare a customs value. So there's two values to consider when shipping. There's a customs value um, and then there's insurance value. Um, the two are totally separate from each other. So don't think that if you declare a low customs value that you have to declare a low insurance value and vice versa. They're totally independent and they're both for very different mechanisms. Um, so a customs value is a, is a nominal value and realistically that should be 10 or 15% of the re replacement value of the goods. So really quite falsely low. Um, excuse me. <coughs> depending on where you're kind of watching from, tuning in from. Um, 
in the UK, we have lots of Facebook buying and selling groups. And on there, you will see a sofa for sale for £25, £50. That same sofa new may well have been £1,000. Um, so, so the customer's value for that sofa is 25 or £50. Um, and that's a really important thing because if you don't get granted TOR and the goods have already shipped, then you're going to end up paying tax on the goods. So you want to make sure it's as low as it can possibly be um, without being fraudulent. Um, but again, we can guide you through that process. Um, and the other value that we should touch on um, is insurance value. And, and that is what it is. You know, everybody knows about insurance. Um, the, the insurance value is generally charged as a percentage of the value of your goods. So the more, the more you insure for, the more you pay. Um, people are sometimes tempted to underinsure, um, which if, if when you're, you're in that mindset, you're thinking about, right, if, if my TV doesn't make it or, or if a piece of furniture gets damaged, it's not the end of the world. So we don't really need to worry about that. Um, that's kind of, we need to move away from that mindset and we need to go on to the mindset of that your goods are being loaded on a boat in a container that the container can fall off the boat and the boat can sink. Um, both very unlikely, both don't happen regularly, but both happen and have happened and will happen again. Um, and the chances of that being your container and that being your boat are so, so slim. It, it, it's probably point something of a percent, but it's still a chance. So, the, and the other kind of fun fact that I've put at the bottom there, which I always find quite interesting, that if, the boat that your container on, is on does sink, then the kind of the recovery process for that um, will be charged to all parties that are shipping on that boat and, and the costs will be split and recovered from all parties on that boat. And your insurance that you've paid for is there to pick up that cost. And, and if insurance is in place, we'll automatically pick up that cost. If insurance is in, isn't in place, Apparently, I've never, never heard of it, but apparently they can pursue you personally for that money, um, which I, I learned that many years ago when I was kind of doing the courses that go with this. I always think it's quite interesting. Um, and that's me. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a recording going out of this, but yeah, I'm, I'm generally available on my mobile. I can't always pick calls up, but I'll always reply to WhatsApps or um, SMS messages and my email is there as well. Um, that's me done. Okay. Thanks, Matt. There are lots of questions, as you expect, that's buzzing on the I chat see, I've here. I've seen a few popping in, but I couldn't see them. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to group them together because some people have asked separate questions, but I think cost is... Cost is number one um, question that's being asked, like what's the cost from Chicago to the UK or from Johannesburg to the UK? Um, so I think overall, there is no magic formula, is there? Um, no, so um, prior, prior to kind of the COVID pandemic and this supply chain kind of squeeze that we're seeing at the moment, I could have, for, for Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the States, Canada, I could have told you within a thousand pounds, a thousand dollars, broadly speaking, what it would cost to move a 20 foot sh shipping container or a 40 foot sh shipping container from any of those destinations back or to from London. Um, and it never really changed significantly. Yes, there's ups and downs with currency fluctuations and fuel going up and down, but nothing significant. It's, it's changing almost every time I go to a shipping line now for a rate, it's not what I expect to see. It's always more expensive than I expect to see. Um, so for me to give a guide price at this point would be false um, because it's just so changing so wildly. And, and last year we quoted quite a lot of work and didn't win it because all of a sudden the prices came down and people managed to ship at a really a significantly lower cost than we quoted and then they jumped up again um, as quickly as that so it really is a fickle market at the moment it generally it didn't used to be it used to be it used to be very very steady 
Um, so it would be wrong to try and give any um, indications. I just saw a question pop up then about sharing a container. And that was earlier on in my presentation, but I missed it out by mistake. Um, so if you're shipping by sea, um, you, we, 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 do do, uh, we do offer a service called Groupage, where for, for popular destinations, um, we can um, group two or three customers together and they can share the space on that container. Um, so it's a very efficient way of doing it because we use all the space on the container and each customer only pays for the space they use rather than paying for the full container. So yeah, it's one, I saw that question pop up so I could answer that one quickly. Okay, um, let's go back to the beginning. I think um, someone has a question about the agents you use in South Africa. Um, Okay. And the agent so, you use in Chicago. So yeah, so um, we we're members of a trade association in the UK. For for a lot of the major kind of US destinations, um, a lot of the city destinations, kind of in, in so the big five for us: USA, Canada, um, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. We have agents that we've kind of built relationships with in the past, um, and we we do reciprocal business with them um, so so they send um full full containers to us and um, for us to unpack and set up and we send full containers to them for us to unpack and set up and vice versa um, if you're shipping from south africa for instance to the uk um and it's as a result of this process you you would be our customer um so so myself or my team would manage that for you and we would handle most of the communication with our South African agents, although there are the practical considerations of what time the crew is going to arrive, you know, can I change my date and this kind of thing, that sometimes it's easier rather than coming through a third party, you, you speak directly to our agents. So we are very open and it is very much a triangle. Um, Juliet in Chicago um, has a question. Can you explain how you manage insurance coverage for the goods? Okay, so um, we we fairly early on in the process we we send you a um, it, it's a paper form, but it can also be a digital form, um, and it's essentially an Excel spreadsheet where we have a, a basic list of most things that you find in a standard house um, that you then declare a value for. So you do you do an inventory kind of um, and and declare it. So I'm sat at my dining table. So a dining table is a line, and you declare two thousand pounds. You've got eight dining chairs; they're five hundred pounds each. And so you declare the values for all of those. Once we have a value, we can then with with our insurance company that we do business with in the UK, we can then. Um, get you a marine insurance policy so it's so it's a it's a, a premium that that is for, for your for your move so it's it's not that you use our insurance you buy a premium um for your move so it's a bespoke policy <clears throat> for your move um for the tory the to, um tor tor the tor yeah tor, um juliet ask is it okay to use the address of a UK-based relative? Yes, it is. As long as you can, um, if, if you can get something sent there with your name on um, that puts your name and address there, then yes, it is. If you can get some kind of proof of address there. Okay. Um, a couple of other questions here. How much lead time for shipment is recommended before moving? Um, what's the process if you haven't confirmed the endpoint residential address yet? Do you have to ship to the UK warehouse, then arrange delivery? Or can you change the delivery address while the shipment is still at sea? Yeah, so it's entirely flexible. So if you haven't got your address, we'll kind of go on the basis that it will be delivered to our warehouse um, and we can hold it until you get your address. Um, Alternatively, if you do get your address while wheels are in motion, so to speak, then yes, we can change the delivery address at the 11th hour, even to the, to the point that 
um, the, the, almost the day before it was supposed to del deliver into our warehouse, we could change it to come to your residence without too much aggro. And what is the recommended, how much lead time for shipment is recommended before moving? Um, don't necessarily understand that question. Sorry. Um, so if you're... I guess the, it says how much lead time for shipment is recommended before moving. I guess it's how from Chicago to UK. Is that roughly is that what we're talking about? Yeah. So, so if we said Chicago to the UK, the voy if if we said a six to eight week voyage, um, so so for Chicago to the UK, we should perhaps allow for for, for safety and for the kind of current delays we're seeing about a ten week process. Okay. Yeah. And um, the. Also ask, do you complete the TOR before or after shipment? Uh, it needs to be before the goods arrive in the UK. Okay. Generally, so it's, e generally it's easier to have done it before the goods are shipped because then all the paperwork is in order before the goods are shipped. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for insurance and custom value purposes, how do you determine replacement value or insurance value for an, an antique item that cannot be purchased new? Um, so the way that we generally do that, if, if it's an item of significant value, um, the way we would do that in the UK would be to get an auction house to come and give you a value to say, if this piece went to auction, it would command the value of X. Um, so there are generally people who can um, give you a steer on what it's worth. The other thing to do is if it's a significant piece, it's potentially already identified on your current household policy. Um, yeah. And if it's on there, then you can get the values <laughs> from that. Uh, how do you manage the quoting process with price fluctuating so much? How do I manage the what? Sorry? The qu quoting the... the, quoting. the so our, our prices are only usually um, valid for, for a finite number of weeks um, until we then need to, to requote um, just to kind of try and protect ourselves a little bit from okay. the fluctuations that we're currently seeing. Okay. Um, we are being we are being hearing lots about demorage. Demorage, yeah. Demorage cost. Kindly explain and why is demorage being charged as an unexpected cost? Um, so demorage is a cost that what when the contain when when the boat arrives um, to the port, the container is lifted off and the container is sat at port. Um, you get a number of days included um, for, for, for the containers to be sat there, um, which is usually up to around the week, sort of between five and seven days. After that point, demurrage is essentially key rent. So, you, so you're renting the space on the key, on the key side for that container to sit. Um, and so the reason that containers are sitting there and, and, and not getting out of the key or out of the port is generally because of the driver shortage that we're all seeing in the press. Yeah. Um, the one fortunate position that we're in is that we run a fleet of um, con container haulage vehicles. So um, as and when your container arrives and as soon as it clears customs and as soon as it's released, then we can, I, I wouldn't say guarantee that you won't pay any demorage but as soon as we know it's available, we can usually collect it within 48 hours. Um, so we, we, we can kind of circumnavigate that problem um, so it doesn't become too much of a problem. And the last question on here, just to clarify the values of the items insured should be pounds? Um, it's 
no, we, we can use a currency calculator. So it doesn't really matter what you declare, what currency you declare in, we will just use a currency. So if you don't declare in pounds, we will use a currency calculator to make the declaration in pounds. And I think I think I covered it all. I hope I didn't miss anything, Mark. Did I miss? Um, there are a few emails in the chat for you, Matt, for you to follow up with some oh, individuals. I'll have a look at those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no so um, some great questions tonight, people. Thank you. Really. So <laughs> do more. Uh, one last one came in from Craig. Understanding your reciprocal agreements with agents in various countries, are we? to obtain quotes from you or the local agent? It, I, I would always say get a quote from me. Um, and I, at that point, we will usually be able to tell you um, who our intended agents are. Um, and uh, our, our quotes should always be similar because our, our agents costs are our agents costs and our costs are our costs this side. They're the only variables that either of us have got any control over. Um, everything else is a relatively fixed cost. Yeah. Do you have an agent in Nam Nam Nambia? Nambia. <laughs> um, I, Not one that I can put my finger on, um, but I can certainly have a look and confirm that. Okay. Um, Nam Nambia is um a challenging destination because there's only really one port um that goods are shipped into and it's a vast country um and from what i remember there isn't a huge rail infrastructure um so sometimes it means the container going significant distances by road um which can pose kind of a little bit of an issue but i can follow that up in more detail when i when i um have a look and just double check with an agent that we've got there. Okay, I did ask for the email address so you can follow up with that yeah. with Thank that you. individual. So I think I think this was great. Lots of great questions. Um, really good questions. If anybody's got any specific questions, they want to just take a note of Matthew's email address. There's certainly, I think Juliet and Craig, I've got your details already that I'll put you in touch with Matt directly as well. With you, yeah, email perfect. Email. I've seen I've seen a few WhatsApps coming in as we're chatting. So oh, okay, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things I would like to add and is that the when you're moving, I think Matt um, said it earlier, someone said it, you may want to consider certain things not bringing it um, because of various reasons. Um, I know antiques are a little bit sentimental, but things like your clothing, depending on where you're moving from, uh, we moved from Colorado where it's sunny, dry, and blue skies 300 days of the year. Like England. <laughs> <laughs> um, but certain fabrics don't go well in certain climates. And, um, and those are the things that you may not want, you may consider not bringing and purchasing here. So there are a couple of blogs that we will be putting together to share those types of information with people relocating. Um, because you, you don't wanna pack, even if it's one small box to, of things or a quarter of a crate or one tenth of a crate with something that you probably can't use or um, it's better off getting it here or more, more cost-effective as well. Um, so, you know, I think you're right, Shanti. Certainly the big five you mentioned, Matt, are the countries, USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. They're all large countries with large furniture. And if I get people at the right place, the right time, I try to tell them, certainly from the States, not to bring a super California king because it won't fit anywhere, let alone get up the stairs, probably. So <laughs> we have that conversation. Right. As well, but... The door width, you know, we sh uh, the just navigating through hallways here. Um, is is very challenging yeah yeah yep. so but yeah um and like i said i moved from the us the few uh september of 2020 and um if i i know juliet and J juliet tonight chatted with mark and shared my moving experience but if there's anything um anyone would like any any help with can just let us let me know as well. I would put my my email address in the chat. Um, it is a stressful 
thing, you know, so uh, let me get that so people can get it. Anything else, Mark? I, I think there's really some really great questions there. I mean, I learned a hell of a lot as I do anyway from all these things. So it's really, really good and really informative. Thanks, Matt. It's really, there's, there's so much. No, I appreciate you. the opportunity. Thank you. So I know there's so much more to what you've described already, but it's just blown your mind already, even just the amount of time it can take and all the logistics in between are, like I say, a ship can, they don't often fall over, sink or whatever, but they have <laughs> happened in the past, but they can take, yeah, six, 10, 12 weeks. It's, it's a long time and there's no, and the price fluctuation for you to give an accurate price must be horrific because you can give a price today, but it might go up, might go down and just with a, you know, the last couple of years, Brexit and everything else have been very, very tough for everyone, I think. Yeah, yeah it's, it's certainly an, un, an unusual period that we're all operating in. I think that um, when you mentioned tracking, that would be a good peace of mind for me because we move so many people and we kind of ask, do you know where your stuff is? Yeah. And normally they don't. They're like somewhere in the Atlantic or Pacific. Yeah. They don't have a general. So to hear you use trackers is quite comforting because yeah like you said it, it's your worldly belongings so it, like just that, just for it. clarity it's not us that use the tracker it's the it's the the shipping lines themselves right so, so if, if you if it was a Maersk ship that you're on for instance then Maersk would give us a login to be able yeah. to track that ship right. so it's not that we would put a tracker in the container it's that yeah. we track the ship itself but the client will have access to that ship. Absolutely, yeah. Right. No, yeah. that's because a lot of people said they don't even know what ship it's on. They'll just know a rough arrival date. Yeah. Right. Um, that's obviously different providers, so that's good to know. Um, one question came in there, Matt. How long before we actually move do you need to to contract with us? If I if we want to move in May. When do we need to reserve a spot? That's from Juliet in Chicago. Um, we should probably start the kind of pre-move survey process soon, um, just to get an idea of volume, start the conversations with our agents in the US. Um, and then really we want confirmation uh, by a month, ideally a month before, if it was, if it was done, done, booked in the diary, dates confirmed, Kind of a month, a month or so before is ideal from our point of view. Yeah. Good, great question again. Yeah. Anything else in the chat that that um? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm I think sure. I think we answered it all. Um, yeah. Perfect. Yes. Uh, there's some emails, and we'll get to Matt, and uh, Matt will follow up um, with several yeah, anything, people. Anything that to follow up on, I'll I'll get Absolutely. to that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Give give me twenty four hours or so. I've got a fairly hectic day tomorrow, but I'll, I'll certainly <laughs> follow them all up. <laughs> That's fine. Well, thanks everyone. Um, do we have the date for the next one, Shanti? Is it 9th of February? 9th of February. Yeah. Of February for anybody out there that's um interested, and I think we're going to be. Uh, moving with pets, which is going to be a really interesting one because we have a pet, pretty much it seems. So I'm not sure you'd be able to ship them, Matt, but that's a different thing altogether. No, definitely not. That's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All yeah. right. Brilliant. Thanks a lot of you. Anyway, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Bye.